Hi, this is Joy Nees with Behind the Art Scene on uh, The Voice of Stockton. And uh, today my guest is Leisha Barnett, and we're going to be talking about the Barnett Community Wellness Center. Uh, thanks for coming, Leisha. Thank you for having me, Joy. All right, so uh, how, how did you get started with uh, wanting to have a wellness center? Well, it was really a long process. <laughs> uh, okay, we're here. <laughs> Over uh, the course of uh, my studies while I was working on my bachelor's degree, I learned a lot about health and wellness that was kind of mind-blowing. I definitely just felt like there wasn't a place for me and my friends and people that I knew um, to have the conversations that I wanted to have. Mm -hmm. and that there wasn't the support that we all were looking for individually. So I thought, well, if I don't see it around me, then maybe I should create it. And that's kind of how it started. That's the short version, but it's literally like me just going back and forth over, should I do this? Can I do this? What does this look like? Mm -hmm. And it is constantly morphing and changing every single day. So where, where uh, you said your studies, where did you uh, study? Uh, Arizona State University online. I have a degree, a bachelor's degree in nutrition. Okay. So my major was nutrition, but my minor was in communication. And health communication was part of my studies. And most of my program was focused on finding the information and about health and wellness uh, through social media and newspapers and television to to see what was being presented versus what the health officials wanted you to know when you go to the doctor and how do you figure out what to do with that information. Mm -hmm. So that is, I spent four years <laughs> <laughs> learning about nutrition and that aspect too. So when at, at the center, what uh, types of things do you offer? So we offer a wide variety of subjects. Um, I have done a vision board party. I've hosted that for someone, <clears throat> another organization. We have done plant-based cooking workshops. I done That was extremely fun because there the people were able to sample and taste uh, mock meats, one of those things that folks are like a little bit scared of, like the fake sausage and <laughs> all of that kind of stuff. We did that, but we also talked about how to create an entire meal without meat and not feel like you're missing out on something. I have done a viewing. I invited Farms to Grow Incorporated to do a viewing of a film called Black Hands in Soil. And that was especially important because of the imprint that African Americans have had in America on our agriculture system uh, to really emphasize that the organizers from Farms to Grow Incorporated brought a wonderful film. You saw it. Yep, that was yep. about the song and the story of tracing your lineage all the way back based on a very small snippet of a song that was saying from the time this person boarded the slave ships all the way to the present day was just so emotional. Yeah. You know, everybody in the room got choked up to be able to see that journey and that process happen. So that that person, um, they, they shared uh, from South Carolina, they had the song and then over um, in uh, what what country was it? Oh, goodness. I'm, I'm forgetting I forget, that. too. <laughs> but over, over in Africa yes. and, and in West the, Africa, they, they shared that same song. And that, that was incredible seeing um her journey over there and and just how welcome she was and right the moment that the song clicked between the two different sets of people thousands and thousands of miles miles away and generations removed from each other was a homecoming it was something that was just so beautiful i really loved it it was it was hard not to cry <laughs> watching <laughs> it and it it, it shows uh i'm I'm thinking a lot about history myself. Um, one of our uh, great uh, Stockton preservationists, uh, he just passed away, his name uh, yes. Ron Chapman. And 
it, just how important it is to preserve our history and to share our stories. You know, so, you know, uh, whether we do that, uh, I, I take a lot of, uh, you know, uh, photography uh, or uh, we do that in videos right. or uh, write, writing uh, books or journals or now however we, we can get so that. we have so many different ways that we can do it, you right. know, and for many, many years, specifically for those from the African diaspora, it was just straight up oral history, like telling the stories, passing it down and there was one person in the tribe in the group at the plantation all the way until now even now in black families that have that thing it's sort of like you've been indoctrinated as the person who is the storyteller you are the person who has this is your job right. to tell the story of your people but thankfully now with technology we have so many more ways but that oral history is still very strong because even my mother, you know, while I was a kid, she'd be braiding my hair and just talking, you know, and your grandmother this and your grandfather that and talking about the people in our family. And that was hours and hours because the hair was just a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but that oral history was important. And sure. I found that those were the stories that I began to tell my daughter yeah. while we were going through the same thing, while I'm braiding her hair, telling her the stories that my mother told me. And what, uh, I just took a trip uh, back east. Uh, we went to a family wedding and, and went to see some family. But then I also went to see some friends who had moved from Stockton. And I wanted to see, you know, uh, where they were living now. And we just happened by the, the Gullah Museum. Yes. And uh, <laughs> that, that was a term that I'd never heard of before. Uh -huh, the you Gullah know. Geechee folks. Yeah. And uh, so, un unfortunately, the museum wasn't open, but I, now I know where it is, and, and I'd love to go back. And um, I guess the, the woman who started the museum, her name is Bunny Rodriguez. Mm -hmm. Do you know her? No, I don't. Yeah. I've heard the name, though. But she, uh, she's famous for uh, making quilts right. and story quilts. And I, I guess uh, she uh, passed away a few years ago, so mm -hmm. we're not able to, to meet with her. But um, her quilts it, live her on. Her quilts. Yes, yes. So that there are so many ways that we can. Uh, and on, on the museum uh, webpage, and I didn't realize this, um, all about singing, um, the song Kumbaya. Kumbaya. Yes. Uh -huh. So they're saying that that is a Gullah uh, word, right. kumbaya, yeah. come by here. Yes. And, you know, I, for years uh, in my church, we would always sing mm -hmm. that. Yeah. You know? And, you know, just just all the similarities and connections, how, how we're all connected together. And not really knowing where things originated right. and how far reaching something as simple as that goes. But their language, they have their own intricate way of communicating. And one of the things when I joined the military, I met a lot of people from the South and quite a few from the Gullah Geechee area. And it took me forever to figure out what they were saying in regular <laughs> conversation. I found myself always going, huh? <laughs> uh, say again, you know, and after some months, it was a lot easier. You know, I'm from California. That's totally different. You know, they call me Valley Girl in comparison to, but the languaging, when you hear it spoken um, in the, um, I think it was a PBS show that I watched once where they had a feature done on the people of the Gullah and the the, the way they communicated, it just rolled off their tongue. It was so beautiful and so intricate and also, like, left you going, well, I think I picked about three words out of that, <laughs> but I still don't know what they said <laughs> at all. So I, I, uh, I, this whole thing is really fascinating to me. Uh, you know, I uh, grew up studying music and, and uh, dancing and, you know, the whole storytelling thing. And, um one thing like Bunny Rodriguez, I wanted to hear in her own words. Mm -hmm. And um, so on YouTube, you can find some of, yes. uh, you know, her speaking. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to like go and study that and, and, you know, try to 
hear what she left us. Capture the passion in her voice for what she right. did. Because quilt making, that was that was real beautiful work. I've seen the quilts, and it's it's amazing. My grandmother made quilts. It was a part of her. She made a quilt out of my um, grandfather's postal uniform. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, yeah, he was a retired postal worker. So quilt making is kind of in my blood, although don't ask me to make <laughs> I, I, I just I, stick to cooking. <laughs> I, I tried one time. I, I don't know. We had these short little needles. I kept stabbing <laughs> myself. I mean, oh, no, right. no, 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 I, I want to do it with a sewing machine, you know, so, some other method. But, right. Um, over there, um, they, they have the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Cor Corridor, and there's four different states, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida, and it's a, a federal uh, heritage area that, uh, you know, the nation has made. And uh, they do uh, all these different events and everything. Mm -hmm. and they have a wonderful website. So, I, I mean, there's so much to, to go and experience and, and uh, I be a part of. I would love to go one day. Like, it's a dream of mine to do a big culinary tour. And that's part of it. Uh -huh. Because there, um, when we talked about this before, the grits that we eat right. on a regular basis is not like the grits of the gullah is so different the flavor is so intricate you can feel and taste the corn and it's done in such a different way everything that they do you can tell the spices and the techniques are from the different regions and it's all blended together it's wonderful and there was a um they um oh so the grits, is that with rice or? Corn. It's corn. Mm -hmm. But they also are connected to uh, rice crops. Yes, definitely. And um, the Farms to Grow, uh, that that was really inspiring that um, over in Africa, they needed um, a certain rice crop, that uh, the seed that mm -hmm. they didn't have. Mm -hmm. And they found it here, like in Oakland, that, uh, you know, we There's could a seed give bank. them something. Yes, yes, the seed bank. It's really important, I find, that as I do more cultural studies and digging deeper into um, that area to find how food, it, it was the unifier. It was the, the, you know, food and the culture all together is just, it's deeper than what we ever could have imagined. And some of the things that I think we have here that we eat on a regular basis, we don't realize the journey, you right, know, right. and the way it came. I mean, when you think about the slave trade in particular, when, you know, coming to the continent of Africa, you know, the Europeans, they found spices. That was like the very first thing, like, we want those spices. What is this that put things into motion? And it's a continent that's just so rich and full that, it, I mean, it's responsible. We have peanuts to thank yeah, for, you know, go. so many different things that, you know, we on a regular basis eat, cook and buy and enjoy and don't even know how deep the, the history goes. Yeah. And I, when I, she, uh, the, the woman from Farms to Grow, and she held up that picture of George Washington Carver. Mm -hmm. I'm going, uh, that kind of looks familiar. Uh, <laughs> right? I really don't know who that is. No. And, but then she just told all these stories, uh, you know, that she found in the archives of the, you know, uh, what Tuskegee uh, university right. and, you know, how important those histories are to, you know, <clears throat> let us know something deeper, mm -hmm. you know, just not, oh, here's a picture, and, okay, he, he did something with peanuts. But. <laughs> right, right, because in the grand scheme of things, when you begin to study his work, the peanut was like the smallest portion right, of right, his life right. and what he was responsible for, and yet that's the one thing that people remember the most. Right. And, I mean, we're talking about a man who was an inventor. He was a scientist. He created a bunch of stuff and was the one who started. And oftentimes in the world of science, you know, a scientist or an inventor may discover one thing or one element, and that one thing may not be the thing that takes off, but it's responsible, the study, the research, and all of that that's done 
is actually what's responsible for this scientist to have done what they did and sure, that one sure. to do what they do. And because there is a record of it and there is all of this other evidence. And I think that's something that we forget sometimes when we're thinking about the first this, the first that, or just American history in sure. general. You know, it's like, well, yeah, but what else? Like, that work is responsible for this work and this work and this work. It's so it's all co connected and influencing each yeah, other. Yeah, absolutely. My, my husband would watch uh, or listen to this certain program, Prairie Home Companion, and, oh, they, yeah. <laughs> and they talked about the rest of the story. So there's, yeah. al there's always more to the story. Mm -hmm. Like behind the scenes, that, that's what uh, we're here, uh, behind the art scenes, just... Uh, and I didn't realize that uh, George Washington Carver was an artist. Mm -hmm. And then that was news to me too so. when we had the Farms to Grow presentation. I, I learned some things and I felt a little bad because I had done a paper a couple of years ago <laughs> on him. <laughs> and she mentioned some things that I didn't know. So it no. made me want to learn even more. No. I didn't know about the artist part. <laughs> So there's a, there's always more to be learned, and but just you know how do we learn those things? Um, you know, finding out, uh, finding these um, resources that we mm -hmm. can look into. Uh, that that's what I, you know, thought. Uh, Ron Chapman, um, he he was absolutely remarkable. That he would take a, a photo, like fo follow the history of our growth. So anytime uh, they were tearing down a building, he would go and take oh, a wow. picture. Okay. And then he'd make a little collage. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, and this happened on this date. So he has everything dated, you know, so all much, the history. So oh, and then, uh, then he would show the thing, uh, oh, what's going to be built there. You know, so he'd show the past, he'd show the, you know, the future and so now we have something to go by, not just, oh, uh, I think that what something happened. Uh, yeah. what, what happened there? <laughs> right. When did that happen? Oh, well, you know, he, he has it all chronicled for us. Um, you can find that a lot of it's on uh, Facebook, mm -hmm. the, the Stockton History <laughs> Facebook page, if you, if you go on that. Yeah, yeah. So, his, uh, his work was important, and I think we need more people who are really interested in archiving yeah. those things because without it I think there's a lot to learn but right. you know there's a lot to learn and when we can see the past the present and the future and you know then we are better off and then also I mean for me not always just letting something go I, I I'm just really devastated that they tore down that uh, the Greyhound station there yeah. that that was a a, a real um, a period of architecture that I think we, you know, uh, don't have that much anymore. Right. You know, and we need that. We need all uh, all eras to represent who we are. You it, know. Yeah, it's really hard so. to be someone who has traveled the world and see how we treat architecture here in America. Yeah. As someone who's been to other places, they they invest in the preservation of things that they they feel it's important they feel mm -hmm. that buildings are important and it's not just a building it's a piece of art um i'm i don't consider myself an artist but i can appreciate art i took a class on um art history and i was really like oh my goodness this is gonna be hard i don't know i can't draw you know but what I found in that class was when describing certain periods, <clears throat> when describing art styles, they were referring to famous pieces of architecture throughout history all over the world. Not a single one of those buildings was here in America. <laughs> <sighs> that's a big ouch number one yeah um but number two it just it just goes to show like i mean it really feels like um we just haphazardly throw things up together and tear them back down so when you do have someone or some entities and persons who are really invested in the preservation of the arts 
whatever art that is, whether it is a building, a painting, a piece of art made with, uh, you know, an element like grass. Like it is literally oh art. <laughs> it's necessary. Where's the camera? You lost the camera. <laughs> I'm really bad at this. <laughs> Maybe. You might need to. There yeah, we go. I'm in, there we go. I'm in there. Can you see it? So those. Uh, that is uh, what I found uh, going through uh, South Carolina. They had all these stands by the roadside, and they said, "Oh, uh, we have sweet grass baskets." And so they had uh, baskets. They made uh, roses, coasters, all kind of stuff. Uh, it, it was just amazing. All the the roadside vendors, and. Uh, there was a woman, the woman that we found that was open, had it right out in front of her house. Mm -hmm. so. Now, much like what we discussed as far as the orators, the ones, the, the griots, that's what we call them, who passed down the stories in the African-American families, this was a skill. This was an appointment as well because the baskets were functional. Right. You know, they didn't become something that folks looked at as novelty to purchase until much later uh, you know in in history this is what dishes were you know the baskets to go pick the the fruits and vegetables they made them mm -hmm. you know and this is what it is it's a very very special gift to have and a skill to learn and it's really awesome that people are still carrying that tradition on yeah you know what well, one thing i found that the woman uh, that sold these things uh kathy tiller and uh, she learned this from her mother, mm -hmm. but now she has some, you know, her children, she wants to pass it on to them. They, they know how to do it, but they don't really want to make the baskets. So it, it is important for the younger uh, generation to, to keep things going. Um, we will lose our history if we don't. Right. I mean, and it's approaching us much quicker than ever before. I feel like because of technology, because we're far removed from the other generations. And um, I feel like a lot of that started right around the time when the civil rights m movement happened. And we started to get more focused on let's go to white collar work versus blue collar work, oh, yeah. you know, yeah. and it was pushed on us to go to college and get an education in order to better ourselves and while there's a place for that, I mean, I have a college degree, right? There's a place for that. But there's also the, a place for the plumber, a place mm -hmm. for the mechanic, a sure. place for the basket weaver. Like society needs all of it together. Right. And I feel like specifically for different cultures and different groups of people, we're like really on the verge of losing it, um, especially like with agriculture and things like that, because it's considered the manual labor. It's beneath them. They don't want to do it because it's hard work. It's physical hard work. And I'd rather sit in an air conditioned office, click clacking away for a few hours a day and then go about my life. But if we aren't careful, we there won't be any more basket weavers and then yeah. somebody will be looking in a museum saying once upon a time folks made these cute little baskets out of sweet grass yeah. and yeah. you know i mean it's one of the arguments that i make for like when i homeschooled my kids because they are artists and everything we did in included art and science like there was no subject if we were doing something in history there was art with the history lesson, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, draw a picture of X, Y, and Z, create something using the tools in this room, all of these things, because I was taught to appreciate it growing up, you know, music and art. And I know that it impacts both sides of your brain and it really helps you to solidify the subject a lot better, yeah. you know, yeah. when you do it that way. But if we lose that, so how, how old are your children now? <laughs> they are now 15 and 10 and not homeschooling anymore. They both decided that they were done with that life. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of was too, but um, it was a great period for us. Mm -hmm. And I think it really helped them um, to mature and, and, and move on into, you know, it, the transition back into school was pretty easy. 
but it still is it, there are some things that you know they wish they had more access to because when you're homeschooling you have the freedom to incorporate a lot more right. so it is a little bit frustrating you know when you know that your child you know is working on his third book <laughs> and that's not something that you know his current school is like rooting for it's like no you got to write this like this and do this like that and you know so it's kind of eh. but you you can kind of supplement uh what what the school well, is doing or? somewhat it get, i guess it just depends i mean they pack their day so much with so much sure. you sure. know when they when they're done with school they're like <laughs> they're done, you know, and they're also athletes. So outside of school, they are playing sports and, you know, they have a full life. But I think that if they had a choice, their normal regular school day would incorporate more music and art because my son really was enjoying playing the drums and the keyboard. He was teaching himself. We bought him a keyboard and all that kind of stuff. And he's really a self-motivated young man, you know, and my daughter is a fantastic artist. She can draw and paint and she's very good with tech, like making edits and all that stuff and creating websites and all sorts of things on the computer. So she's into graphic design and lots of other elements. So I'm really happy. You know, my husband's an artist. I really am happy that art is a foundation for us. Right. Because yeah. I, I mean, I remember um, in my own life, I, I was in Campfire Girls. I, mm -hmm. I, I learned a, a lot of, you know, skills from that and, and um, you know, in, in um Going to church, we were always doing arts and crafts. Yeah, and, the and children's then, church and vacation yeah, Bible school. Ba vacation Bible school. <laughs> yes, and, uh -huh. and, uh, but then also in, in my classes, my, my teachers, they incorporated, like uh, in math class, we did string art. You yes, know? you so, remember those with so, the nails and the string. Yeah, and, and so, you know, uh, oh, you go from this number to that number and, and ratios and this. Yeah, so I mean, everything you you learn about different subjects together, and how how it's all connected. And um, like when uh, I was studying science, we would go out and oh, uh, pick a, a branch off the tree and draw that and see the growth, you right. know, over a two week period. Right. And um, the other thing about the the whole garden thing, I I love when my my father had a garden in our backyard. And, you know, we could have our own you know, fruits and vegetables from yes. our own home. And, and we need, I think we need to get back to that. You know. I am working really hard with a lot of people in the city right now to bring a, a comprehensive program to Stockton for um, gardening um, for the, with the schools. And, and because I'm learning to grow, I've been growing food for a couple of years now. And it's kind of been, it's been a trial and error. I won't say kind of, it's been a trial and error thing with me putting seed in soil and going, oh, look, there's a tomato, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and not really knowing the science part behind it, but I just started to kind of like, okay, I remember my dad would do this. My grandmother would do that. My, you know, and I've seen the the gardening over the years. I knew that my uh, grandparents preserved foods and that my grandfather had um, compost and worm farms and there were chickens in the backyards of both my grandparents houses and things like that so I grew up seeing it and even in Oakland where we lived if my, we didn't have a lot of land my dad would always like plant some herbs and a couple of vegetables you know so that we can get those at home and as I've gotten deeper into my study of history, health and wellness, and culinary arts, it was a natural thing for me to say, it's time to grow some food. And it's time to not only grow food, but I incorporated gardening in my homeschool adventure with my kids and working with other people to teach other people how to grow food and just the impact that that has on you in so many ways. Because it's not just about what you're eating. The simple act of putting your hands in soil, there have been studies done that's shown that it affects you psychologically in a positive way. 
And, you know, a lot of people would say that the hippie folks back in the day would do grounding principles where you stand in the grass and in the soil without your shoes on, barefoot, flat, planted, and just take it in, you know? And, you know, that's kind of like some people say, oh, yeah, that's it. But it is, that is a real thing. It is a real stress reliever. It is a real experience and ever since I was little I enjoyed being at the park near water anywhere where there was trees and grass and natural elements and learning to grow food learning to cook the food that you grow the experience of just being out in nature where your phone is gone the TV's off you know you're with your family and your loved ones it's just a great experience it just makes me feel good all inside to think about i, I loved uh, the farms to grow they um uh, talked about a um uh, this farm i think it's out by Esparto. are 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 you guys going to uh, like organize a, a field trip over we there we definitely or? are i just spoke with well i got an email from elaine today and um We are working on putting some things together in the near future for some field trips to the farm because I definitely want to go visit that that place. It sounded amazing. But outside of that, um, to bring things locally here and kind of start to get the people energized, um, I've partnered with Patricia Miller from Center Plate, and we have an event coming up this month. June 21st and June 22nd, and it is all about reconnecting with our history in a positive way, with the land in a positive way, and embracing nature, teaching people that going back to our roots, getting our hands in the soil is where we should be beneficially, and it's really going to be a good time. I'm really excited about it. I hope it will give people a different look. So where where is that going to be? So it's going to be our box track community farm, okay. which is uh, the address is four six six South Ventura Ave, and um, so on the twenty first, uh, we're going to have Farm to Grow will be there, and they are going to do a screening of their film for a select group of folks who attend the roundtable discussion that will be facilitated by Patricia Miller have a seat at my table, and then Saturday is the day of the the um, event you could say it's a festival I guess but it's like if I say festival people are going to think like festival it's like festival (laughs) 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 it's just a group of local folks who want to get together and celebrate Juneteenth and that was the that was really what was my catalyst was that I have never in my adult life really celebrated Juneteenth. And even though there is a Juneteenth celebration that happens here in Stockton and in other cities all around, I really wanted to do Juneteenth in a particular way because in a way that like I'm really passionate about health and wellness, the land and growing food and recognizing black farmers. And so I thought this is an opportunity to create something that I haven't seen. Much like with the Barnett Community Wellness business as a whole. It was like, well, there are things that I want to discuss and do that aren't currently existing where I am. So, all right, let me just create something and see what happens. That's where this celebration came from. So on Saturday, June 22nd, from 10 to 5, we're going to have a lot of fun. I'm going to have a um, corner, a kid's corner, where the children will learn about gardening in a fun way with arts, of course, face painting and all that cool stuff. They get to actually incorporate art with the theme of gardening. And there will be a little game corner. So... When I think of Juneteenth, all I could think of was, okay, I remember my uncles and grandfathers playing spades and dominoes and chess and checkers. So a little game corner for folks who want to do that. Some vendors where people can shop and browse and learn about businesses in the area. And then there's me with the nutrition and 
information, all the cooking stuff. And I'll do a roving podcast where I just go around and talk to all the people that are there. And I think it's just going to be a great afternoon. So I'm oh excited. God. So you, you just had a, um, <laughs> another event a couple days ago. What, yes, what, I had a health fair health June fair. 1st. Yes, yes, yes. Again, it was one of those things where I was like, okay, I feel like doing something. So I'm just going to see what happens, throw caution to the wind and reach out to some folks. And we had a health fair at the wellness center where um, people could come and get health assessments done. Um, there was someone from Covered California there to assist with signing up for um, health insurance. <clears throat> we had Cruising for Health there. Pamela Cross from Cruising for Health was there, and she does um, traveling, cooking lessons, and she's a master of public health, and so she does all of these wonderful things on, on a traveling basis. She just goes from city to city, event to event. She was there, and then there was a local esthetician on site who was talking about skin care and all those wonderful things. So it was a good time. I was able to do a cooking demo and a little talk about health and wellness, and the cooking demo was vegan, and I have a friend who doesn't eat vegetables, and she has seconds. Wow. of the vegan dish. I was really excited. So uh, what, what, did, what did you prepare? So I prepared a simple uh, skillet saute of lacinato kale. Lacinato kale is also known as dinosaur kale. And it is the, it's the kale that I prefer because as a chef, that other curly kale is the stuff that we use to decorate like displays uh, food. <laughs> gar garnishing okay it's the, gar <laughs> the lacinato kale is the kale i like to eat so i did a saute with lacinato kale mushrooms red and green peppers onions garlic and ginger and liquid aminos and that was literally all the ingredients to it <clears throat> it's a very simple and easy to make dish that has a lot of flavor and that is really the key. When I am doing cooking lessons and demos, I want people to know that they can eat vegetables. It's not complicated. It doesn't take forever. You don't need a ton of ingredients. And everything that I used in that class was already pre-sliced and chopped and all of that. So look, go buy these things. You don't have there to chop go. anything. <laughs> you know, so it's less intimidating because I know people really get freaked out about that kind of stuff so <laughs> i i, I uh, go back to the the program uh, the farms to grow i i loved um they had a sheet about putting together uh what uh, your african uh kitchen or oh yeah that was um that was actually mine oh that was your yeah second. yeah i'm a certified always instructor and old ways is an organization that <clears throat> They originally started with the African American Diet Pyramid, but they have since expanded and they have one for Asian American, Hispanic American, uh, Mediterranean. And what their um, vision and goal, it's a nonprofit organization, what their vision and goal was to take the, the foods that people naturally ate by heritage and construct a pyramid showing them the best uses and best practices of what you currently eat. And that was really attractive and important to me because if you've ever gone to the doctor and they tell you to lose weight or anything, what do they tell you to eat? They tell you to eat some stuff you probably didn't grow up eating and don't know what it is. And the only reason why I know what those things are is because I'm a chef and I've been around the world and I have had those things, but the average person hasn't. Yeah. With this program and with the tools that I get by being a certified instructor through them is the ability to say, what, what do you like to eat? What is something you grew up eating that you feel is kind of cultural i personally I, I love vegetables i love zucchini okay so you know if if you ate zucchini a particular way let's say you baked your zucchini with cheese and stuff on it and your doctor is like you might want to back off of the you know instead of telling you to eat cottage cheese or something else that is unfamiliar like hummus that is one of the most common things like eat some hummus and crackers and like not many people I know enjoy it. No one in my house does except for me. Mm -hmm. um, 
I can meet you where you are and say, since you enjoy zucchini, here are some ways that you can prepare it that may feel better to you. It fits better with your palate, with your cooking abilities and all of those other things. So that's why I had the, the sheet there to give an illustration of this is what we currently eat, but here's a here's a little cheat sheet for you, a guide. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to learn more about that. I, uh, that's really fascinating to me. So, so um, we'll have to get you in for some yeah, classes yes, so you I can learn so. some new dishes, yes. huh? Because <laughs> the, the doctor's saying, uh, oh, uh, <coughs> cut back on the dairy and the sweets. and the, uh, Yeah, that dairy uh, is, uh, the dairy will sneak up on you. It will be one thing that you just don't realize affects you the way it does until you reduce the amount of it. And then you go, oh. Okay. <laughs> it's just, it's such an easy go to, like, you know, have a cheese quesadilla or something. You know why yeah. it's an easy go to. Dairy is easy to go to because it meets the needs of the flavor profile that's the happy place. You got the fat, you know, and not fat as in, in a, I don't consider fat to be a bad word. Fat as in the texture, the creaminess, and the fact that it sits in you and makes you feel satiated. So you feel fuller. That's why a lot of vegetarians don't go vegan because of the cheese, not because of anything else other than the cheese and the dairy products help them to feel a little bit fuller. And then you have the salty. Most cheeses, you can, like, there's a thousand and one different types of cheese, right? You can go super salty. You can go tart. You can go sweet. You pair it with fruit. I mean, it really is kind of like this thing where I could have a plate with a boiled egg, some cheese, a few nuts. You know, and you build this little flavor profile, but without yeah. the cheese, it doesn't quite come together, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just a perfect thing. You know, and I say it's not always about completely eliminating things, but sometimes it is just adjusting and balancing. Like, I'm not dairy-free, but I definitely don't consume as much dairy as I used to, and my body is happier for it. Yeah. So I I just really love the Barnett Wellness Center that you, you've opened that to the arts and the... Uh, you know, I, I know that um, you had the vision board class. You had, how did that one, uh, there was one about scriptures or? Uh... Oh, that was the art, um, the prophetic scripture art painting class. That one actually had to be canceled, oh, yeah. <clears throat> rescheduled, I should say, because of the scheduling issues. But we are having a soap making class on Saturday. Right. Um, and that is going forward, the mission and the goal is to partner with people in the community who might have a skill or talent and have an ability to teach it to the public and don't have the space. You know, I am all for, I'm excited to partner with people who want to bring that out and we can do something together. I had a call with someone today about a partnership that's, you know, evolving and I'm looking forward to bringing her idea to the wellness center because for me wellness is music wellness is art wellness is <clears throat> everything put together it's mental health i mean if there's somebody out there that wants to host a um a poetry event you know or a group therapy session where y'all got some stuff on your mind you want to <laughs> like you know let it out then the wellness center is there for that that's really what my true vision is not just in the one element of the food, but also the community at large and what that looks like. And I know that there are a lot of people here in Stockton who have a lot of varying skills and talents and desires and things that they want to see and do. And call me. We can work something out. So how, <laughs> how, how, how do you get the word out to you know, recruit people? Uh, the main, uh, the biggest way is I'm a social media person because it's free, and I think it's foolish not to utilize free social media. Uh, word of mouth is 100% how it works. Um, various Facebook groups, the Barnett Community uh, Wellness has a Facebook page. Chef Leisha has a Facebook page. I have Instagram and Twitter, and I post regularly there. Also, the Women in Business group that I formed with Chef Tobias Cooks. 
Um, we have a large number of women in the group who are here in this area and, um, you know, they connect with me. I get messages and phone calls often from the women I have met through the group who are also business owners here. So it's usually word of mouth and, and just a consistent of, uh, putting myself out there and letting everybody know I'm an extrovert. So I'm like, call me. <laughs> so that, that's why she's on the show to, today so, <laughs> to, to let you all know about the wellness center. Where, where is that located? It is located at five, six, six, five North Pershing Ave unit a four. And that that's kind of uh, across from uh, what the Dave Wong's. Well, kinda... yeah, it used to be Dave Wong's. It's a, a ramen place now. Oh, ramen, okay. Yeah. And I think the, the wing guy is moving across oh, the street okay. over there, too. But I know Power 45 is right across the way there. It's the DeVita Dialysis right directly across. And my space is the first building, and it's on the end. You know, usually... It's, it's on the front of the building. Facing the uh, street. Facing the street. <laughs> uh, I got a little lost when I first went there. Listen, but, yeah, but. everybody does, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when I have events, I try to put balloons and signs and yeah, stuff out the there signs. so that people know where to go. But it is definitely um, a space that I'm really proud of because it started out as just an idea and a concept. And now it is something that is evolving and happening. So I'm really happy about that so when when did you guys open uh, it was the end of february so when i, I mean, had my grand opening yeah so it's been a, just a few months but you, <laughs> you you've been doing wonderful things trying there. to stay busy joy yeah, yeah. <laughs> so i really look forward to the the whole uh, juneteenth at box tract that sounds uh, interesting i mean um, i've been to the one over at uh, they have it at the mm-hmm. taft uh-huh. community center <laughs> And it's more uh, entertainment mm-hmm. and, and uh, a little bit about the history. But. Yeah. So it's going to be good. I mean, I feel like this summer is the summer of activation and creation. So I have some things that I'm working on putting together to be ready and available um, probably the end of summer by the beginning of fall. Recording new podcasts and having more classes unveiled and some partnerships in the works with community members where we are going to incorporate more arts and more other, um, like hopefully some music, you know, small band engagements, whatever. I'm open. I really want it to be a cultural hub where people can feel like they're welcome, they're free, and they can come in there and just feel like it's a it's a chill spot. Yeah, yeah. So ha- how many people can that uh, can the space? Well, go? if we move all of the tables and lined it up for seating, um, I want to say we could probably seat fifty. Yeah, yeah. If we had like you know just someone in front and then so we could seat about fifty people. Okay, very good. Um, so Farms to Grow, there you said they would show their uh, the movie again. Yes, yeah. yes. I spoke to Elaine, and Farms to Grow Incorporated will be at the Juneteenth event on the Friday evening for the seat at the table, um, and that is going to be fantastic. It's going to be an evening showing at the farm. I think it'll be pretty awesome. That'll be nice. Yes. So uh, th- is it that same movie or, or a different movie? Um, I believe she's bringing that one, but also the others. We had some technical difficulties when she came, so right. we didn't get to see the full collection. But I think that um, after talking that day, we worked out the kinks, and uh, the there will be other movies to present as well, some of the shorter films. When I first saw the film collection in Oakland, there um, there were definitely um, some other films that I think that the the folks would really enjoy hearing and seeing. So when when do you think we might be uh, able to go uh, to that farm? I don't know. I'm going to be reaching out to Elaine over the weekend, and I hope to put a trip together by the end of the summer so that we can go. All right. I want to go. I want to go. Uh, put put me on the list. Okay. You'll get on the list, Joy. <laughs> So, um, 
Have, have you uh, been doing much with Malia? Or Oh, uh, yes, yes, yes. Me and Malia are pretty tight. I've been meeting up with her, and she's going to be probably included in some of those plans in the near future that we have happening okay. at the Wellness Center. I'm, I'm, I'm keeping my fingers crossed because we got some good ideas going between the two of us. I, I loved her vision board class. I, yes. I, you think maybe she would do another one? Or? I definitely would like to do another one. Traditionally, what I found is people love to do vision board classes at the beginning of the year. But now that we're at the halfway point of the year, I found myself looking at my old vision board going, it's time to kind of like reset and kind of put a new plan into place. So, and I'm uh, the type of person who likes to take a moment to look at my goals at every change of season. I don't know why I just feel drawn to do that, that I get this creative surge every time the season changes. So we probably, hopefully will be having a vision board party before um, September um, or right early September. I'm hoping that that can happen because I definitely feel like the energy shift um, I'm like the kid who loved back to school time, you know, so whenever we had to go back to school shopping and I bought those first pair of loafers and the sweater, yeah. you know, like <laughs> there's the sweater, you know, so I just feel like that's a good time to reset. That, that sounds uh, like a good plan because uh, I've been thinking a lot about uh, what was on my vision board and one thing was uh, travel, mm -hmm. but I, I think I need to define that a little bit more. It's not just get, go in any place just for for the for heck the sake of it. Of going, but yeah. but it's something purposeful. Yes. And when we we traveled down, you know, um, all the East Coast, and it was places I hadn't been before. Mm -hmm. I'd always wanted to go, and then I saw some things that you know related to what you were doing, and I, you know, so. so travel with a purpose and, yeah. and a meaning so uh i just uh found out that uh that's about all the time we have <laughs> but we uh, can talk all day about I know, this stuff, I huh? know. That's <laughs> so uh that, that's really exciting about juneteenth and uh, we'll get that information out there look forward to the the trip to the farm and everything yes. else that's happening at uh, barnett community wellness center thank you joy and it's uh, at pershing uh, what's the address 5665 north pershing ave unit a4 okay on the front of the building facing the street <laughs> and uh, Th thank you very much for uh joining us on behind the art scene uh with uh leisha barnett my um, guest for today. See you next time. Thank you.